Hello, sweet legends. I am so glad you're here. For those of you who, if it is your first time you are here, welcome to Does It Hurt When You Do That? Don't Do That, the podcast where I, JJ, talk to change makers about the things we do and don't do that hurt and other stuff. Today's guest is just what the doctor ordered. Sam O'Sullivan is a gentle soul who is driven by his values of compassion and mental health. He is a clinical psychologist who has done a bunch of wonderful things for mental health in New Zealand. I met him while he was shooting the third season of Tough Talk, a doco series where he travels to rural places in New Zealand talking to mostly men about masculinity and their experience of mental health. He is a clinical psychologist also for Clearhead, which is an online one-stop shop platform designed by New Zealand doctors that empowers Kiwis to find their help they need. And Sam is also the wellbeing coordinator for the Learning Environment, which is a living campus at Piwaka Waka Farm that offers eco-courses that heal and develop capacity for personal and collective resilience. I'll probably get the crew from the learning environment on for a later episode because what they're doing there is sensational and ace and exciting and the future is bright. But anyway, in this episode, Sam and I talk about values, failure, perceptions of masculinity, vulnerability, and how to courageously have hard conversations. And when I say how, I mean like actual steps and tones of voice and ways to approach it from someone who... It's their job to have hard conversations, right, as a clinical psychologist. So we talk about the fundamentals of good therapy and healing, which is really helpful at this time because, well, I know mental health, I'm experiencing it, it's pretty strung out right now and it's weird and the waiting lists are long to see therapists and even the psychologists and counsellors are going through all these issues. We are experiencing a global health pandemic that's still going on. It's also becoming a bit of a mental health pandemic, right? Heads up at around the 21 minute mark, there's mention of a relationship where there was sexual assault. Um, And soon after that, we talk about ducks. And I reckon it's sticking around for if you can, because Sam is a gentle soul and his insight and wisdom is so practical and helpful. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. Thanks for your messages and shares. Leave a review if you like on the iTunes. And this conversation actually starts halfway through because he was saying something really cool and I just had to hit record. So when this intro finishes, it's going to start halfway into the conversation. We can just walk into this room where it's you and me talking to Sam O'Sullivan. People are like, oh, don't say you failed. I'm like, I say I fail all the time, but really? I'm not a, f- yeah, I'm not a failure. I think it's really, I think it's just like a really important worth is actually being able to say things like that because you're not saying you're you you are a failure as a person. You're mm-hmm. saying I failed at something. So it's I've actually found it quite empowering just to like be really straight up about about things like failing. I'm like, yeah, I failed at that. Yeah, like that didn't go well. Um, I stuffed that up. I'm not a stuff up. I'm, yeah. I'm more, I'm more good. Yeah. And I find it's funny. People just don't want to say those things. I suspect it's because they don't fully believe that they are not a failure. And that's why they're scared of it. When did you learn that? Or has it always been like that for you? I just to, thought about that the other day. Yeah. I mean, I just that particular thing I was thinking about because it was mainly because I said I failed at something and a friend said, no, you didn't fail, blah, 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 like reframed it. And I was like, I don't need that reframed. I felt really good about saying I failed. And it, it sort of hit me and I was like, oh, I wonder why that was. So I reflected and was came to the conclusion that it was because I don't feel like I'm a failure and I can say that. And and maybe she was projecting onto me. Um, and I just didn't, yeah, I just didn't need to. I really like, nah, like I actually, I always remember certain things in my life where like I have failed. You know, when you just fail at something, big time a really good example was my friend was at this meditation retreat and her dog had died um and i really she was a really close friend and i wanted to do something really nice so i set up this um thing where we like got a floating sort of raft and put fire on it and we're going to light it on fire and just send it down the river as a send-off um but basically stuffed it up and it just like kind of like 
sunk. <laughs> it all went out. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, I just looked at it. And I was like, sorry, that was a complete fail. And she's like, yes, yes, it was. Because <laughs> it was like quite an emotional moment that just didn't pan out the way we envisioned it. And it was totally my fault. And I just, I was like, oh, I can just, that's, I failed. I failed. That's, and I didn't feel bad. About, I mean, I felt bad about not succeeding in that situation, but I didn't feel bad about myself. And the sentiment was there as well. I find it's always funny when, you, when, especially when you're like trying really hard for something special, you know, <laughs> and then, you know, you're like, we're going to have the best day. <laughs> and then, you know, things like that can fail. To- yeah, to- yeah, totally, totally. Like expectations, eh? Um, yeah, I don't know if she was that stoked, like, <laughs> on the situation. Um, but like, that's okay. Like, it was. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I learned from it. I was like, I should have just got in the river because it was part of partly how I launched it. So I was like, if I had just got wet, I was in my like onesie, so I was like, didn't want to get my onesie wet. But I should have just got in the river or just stripped off mm. and done it. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. So I've actually surreptitiously started recording here. I, I noticed. I can see you, the audio you things. Can see the your, audio things recording. Thing. So because, uh, well, you know, just trying to be essentially as organic as possible and, and mm. your insight is so wonderful. So thank you so much for being here. You're my guest today. Who are you? Well, my name's Sam. Sam O'Sullivan is my full name. Um and I'm a human um, that does all sorts of things. Do you want me to talk about some of those things? You can do it however you like. Yeah, I suppose I suppose the easiest way, what I say to a lot of people, rather than trying to like kind of just like list off the things I do, is I talk about my values, something a friend taught me to say. And I, I think I, you know, I really value compassion and mental health because of my own experiences. So that's my main focus really is is kind of mental health um, and well-being and on a deeper level I think what I'm about is fusing a approach that brings kind of like art and spirit spirituality together with science in a really grounded way to express that um, to benefit hopefully like all all, all beings all, all life all, all everything um, so that's that's who I am and I do that through a number of things including jobs <laughs> Thank you so much. I love that. And that is something that I also resonate with because I think that, well, you know, we are in this society that we live in. We need to have a job as such. And Mm. maybe you do it driven by a value or it's something that you're good at. You know, if it's what you value, you're probably going to spend more time on it and so on. But I think that I'd be really interested what you think is, is when you come across people who I guess are in a job that doesn't align with their values or they aren't sure of what their values are. And then for you, what I guess has changed or if you felt more empowered from kind of seeing yourself through that kind of lens of value. Through the lens, yeah, yeah. I mean, honestly, it just simplifies talking to, to folk because one of the first thing people say is, you know, what do you do um, once you get past the weather? And I've always found that hard to answer or like, where am I from? I found that hard to answer too. Um, so I, and then I start listing off various things and I tried to like categorize them. Um, and that didn't work very well. So I, I found that cause what I think what people are looking for is something to connect to. They just want something and they can then go, Oh, you're this. And I can relate to that. And therefore we can connect and have a conversation. They don't really need to hear a massive list of all the things I do. And I'll just look kind of blank and like, they don't want to be there anymore. Um, (laughs) Yeah. And then my my main kind of job title is um, I'm a clinical psychologist and that kind of scares a lot of people and change usually changes the conversation into one of, um, you you know, what's going on. They kind of get self-conscious. I think people get self-conscious um and then it suddenly they're like really enjoying talking to me and suddenly they feel on the back foot and maybe I'm like reading their mind or observing them or all the things that probably every person's doing but for some reason they perceive me to be an expert at which maybe I am but I don't think I don't think in the way they perceive me to be I think I I I think everyone is observing each other and thinking about each other and maybe I'm doing it more accurately but not not always sometimes I'm just like thinking about mundane stuff and like not really even paying attention and I just I just you know I just not that focused on 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 the person 
and yeah and it, and as a psychologist i do that through you know asking really intentional questions and talking to someone for ages about their life and that's how i find out about people it's not it's not through um reading their body language yeah um, yeah <laughs> yeah thank you it's always i remember similarly that thing of they're reaching for connection and then sometimes the the job title i mean if it's something really fascinating then it can bring in a lot of connection but i guess you know we are so much more than what we do we we are we mm. be and and yeah i really appreciate you sharing your perspective on that are you ready for the first other question which is also known as the second question <laughs> <laughs> Oh, the second question. One of my um, one of my psychologist um, mentors wrote a book called The Second Question. He believes it's the most important. Of what the is questions. the second question in your psychologist book? Well, he just wrote a book called The Second Question. Hey. He, I think what he was trying to say is sometimes it's the next question, the follow up question, um, that's more important than the initial question. So go on. <laughs> if I was to say to you, "Does it hurt when you do that? Don't do that." For you right now, what is that? Or in your life in general, what is that? Something that you've been doing that you're like, ah, oh, don't do that. Hmm. Probably just um, working too much. Yeah, like just um, working to the point that I get a headache, or um, that I don't sleep well, or that I neglect my self care and eating well, and, um, and those sorts of things. Yeah, or people, or like other values, other aspects of who I am as a as a being. Um, relationships because because I'm just overdoing one aspect um of the different themes that make up who I am perhaps could I overvalue it because of perceived ideas of success or money or expectation from others that I work with that kind of thing yeah so when we met I think I'm trying to figure out exactly when we met but I know that at one point you were with Dane Scott and you were working on the documentary Tough Talk so that's one element of what you do in your work as a clinical psychologist. Um, hmm. Have you found that it's in that, or would you like to describe, I guess, where the realm is? Because it is quite involved with like connecting with people about their experience of mental health and going to places and things like that. Is that kind of where, I guess, the, the, the boundary of like what is work has kind of opened up? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I don't have a great boundary there. Um, it's probably more so for my paid work, um, less so for my unpaid work, which is the majority of my work. Um, so your tough talk was, I just lived that, you know, I just lived, you know, for, for those who don't know what tough talk is, it was a, essentially a documentary series um, on men's well-being in New Zealand. And I say men, but that was more just to communicate it simply. It was about the idea of masculinity or, or gender, particularly for people who may identify as, as males. Um, or at least with that aspect of gender. And, you know, I traveled around in my van and I talked to a bunch of different people from different places in the country about their stories, the journey of, um, I guess, experiencing that social norm um, of, of, like, you know, being strong and a, a man in New Zealand, which is, uh, from what I understand, really similar in Australia, and and what they did to overcome some of their own challenges. I mean, most of them were still on the journey. And... Yeah, that was, I mean, that was my life, you know, I just like, yeah, I was in a, a high ace bed and there was, there was no separation, but it was also great because I was traveling the country and talking to interesting people and spending time and, you know, I, I sort of made the brand nature kind of intentionally, for, I mean, for a lot of different reasons, but um, one is just kind of got to spend time in, in beautiful places in New Zealand. That was probably the most self-interested aspect of it, though more deeply, I guess the way I informed or even started that project was because of some of the imbalances I, 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 th I thought I could see in nature um, around perhaps there being an orientation from humans of like kind of more like control and dominance of natural phenomenon or of nature, which I saw as maybe masculine. Whereas like, you know, the way I saw nature work in terms of like, I know, say, say a complex river system, it's beautiful and it's, it's organic and it moves and how it wants to move and it flows and, joins up um and that to me perhaps could be seen as more feminine um though like yeah those that sort of dichotomy i don't actually see it as a dichotomy i see it as a system that that's interconnected but yeah like some people might not agree but yeah i thought perhaps like putting a dam in that system and creating one giant river and putting concrete balls could be seen as masculine so i was starting to see some of the environmental problems and thought huh maybe that's to do with like 
almost like what's happening within us um, socially. Um, so I thought maybe by challenging that aspects of dominance, it's, you know, it might help the situation. Kind of like, you know, if you saw an abusive relationship in a, say, a man dominating a woman, you you might sort of support that man the or well, like from my, my perspective support sounds not the right term but you'd help him understand that that's based on like a problem and like an insecurity perhaps in his early days um, of dating he was rejected so therefore he was trying to control the situation which is often actually the case so um, I thought maybe if I could help me and see that maybe it would have implications for the earth and climate issues mm. and in and in the making of this project, what did you find in terms of what masculinity is or this conception or how it is changing? Mm, it's a big question. And like, it's funny, like any question, the more you um, think about it and talk to people about it um, and hear all the different perspectives on it, the less you feel like you know the answer to that. Yeah, the um, more you know, the more you don't know, right? Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. And like, yeah, I mean, the, I mean, the most obvious things I could see was masculinity was perceived as like strength, particularly strength through dominance and control and success, success in terms of like financial wealth, the ability to provide status and power. Whereas, um, and those things aren't, they're not, they also could be seen as feminine. It's just, I think feminine is kind of doing the same thing, but with more like, um, I don't want to say like letting go, but you know, if you know what I mean, it's like more, I had a better word for it. I just can't think of it right now. More like, uh, it's like, it's like surrendering. I'll give you an example. It might make more sense. Say you're experiencing an emotion. You could try to control it, like dominate it and block it, or you could, um, feel it and just go with it and like let it happen. And I think that's a good analogy or metaphor. It's not really a metaphor, is it? It's an analogy to just like, the inner forces and like the outer forces in the world and the approach of masculinity and femininity. And I think they're actually both valid. I don't actually think either one is bad. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think they work together really beautifully. Um, it's just that they may, maybe have become imbalanced through, through power dynamics within, within and between genders. Gender itself is a complicated um, thing. Like, yeah, in terms of like even um, biological sex, it's, you know, it's not straightforward. Um, and some people obviously don't see themselves as, um, as belonging to um a biological sex yeah and even genetically of like the more i've learned i'm like man what a yeah one of the ducks here just had a sex change i don't know ducks had a sex change they what yeah yeah like this duck well the male got killed by a dog um so there are two female ducks and i was slightly relieved because they stopped having ducklings which often get killed by the predators here on the farm where i live and but then one of the females developed the curl in a tail and I thought oh maybe it's just developing like the male tail but then they had ducklings and then I look into it and they can change biological sex only female to male in order to procreate wow that is pretty cool yeah they're almost like oh you know what you know I know this doesn't apply to humans but like it just it just begs the question of what it you know why are we even thinking about penises and vaginas um, mm. when it comes to gender. That's so such a wonderful way of describing it. I mean, you know, the feminine is more about the receiving and the accepting. How, like in this, um, I guess, you know, changing of the paradigm and the perspective, have you been met with much resistance? <laughs> the other day I was talking to my old neighbor and he was like, he's old, you know, he's in his eighties. And he was like, there's no real men. <laughs> and I was just like, he's really deaf and he's Greek. And I don't know if I can go there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how do you, when if, if you are met with res- resistance to this, how do you approach it? Hmm. It's funny, the first, I thought people who might have the biggest resistance might, might, might be feminists. They're like, why are you trying to help men who have, you know, because of the patriarchy, because of power? But actually, no, most, if not all feminists I've met are like, yeah, men need help. Yeah, men need to start questioning gender. Yeah, like, you know, so that, that there was actually probably more resistance came from men, um, which was interesting. Um, and like you said, some of it comes from more that men's rights type movement of like um there are aspects of that like i would always listen to people and the aspects of that i could understand around like ch- childcare 
within divorce, for instance, isn't maybe always fair on men and um, they can get a really hard time because of it. But, you know, I'm like, well, that's, you know, there's also a lot of other power imbalances you just focused on one. But so that's where some men were coming from because of their own experience. So they would challenge some of the rhetoric that I was learning from feminism um, that I was like taking over to thinking about masculinity. I would find men in groups were sometimes more challenging. Like, I'll give you one of my favorite um, experiences talking to this guy, I guess you'd call him kind of bogan, quite like hypermasculine. And he was really opening up to me about a relationship and about actually um, essentially like sexually assaulting a friend. And they were actually, they were working through it. It was, you know, an issue of consent around, yeah, caught up in power, caught up in miscommunication, caught up in all sorts of things. But like they were friends and they were working through it. And he was telling me all about this being super vulnerable and emotional. And I mean, and then some of his mates walked up and he literally just his whole mannerisms changed and his body posture changed. And he sort of, his voice deepened and he said, it's something like, how, how's the cock, bro? Like, how's the cock <laughs> to his mate? And I was just wow. like, oh man. And I was just like, wow, what a change in events. Like, wow. And then he just, they talked and muttered and we just said guy stuff for a while and then he left and he just started continuing the conversation with me like nothing had happened <laughs> and that, that to me was like oh okay so by himself and I found that generally if someone would be um challenging of me um by themselves they were quite different than in the group and I would often just say something like they were like oh you gotta be tough and I'd, I'd say something really relatable like oh have you ever lost a partner and they'll be like oh yeah that was hard you know, and most guys would agree with that. I didn't get to just find something and then use mm-hmm. that as a, um, I don't know, maybe not the word use, but then like, you know, go with that as a way to have that discussion. And that usually worked really well. Yeah, I'm not sure if I came across anyone. I mean, if someone was just, I could tell they were close to what I was saying, I just probably wouldn't engage them because I think I would just know there was no winning. So I just wouldn't. So there weren't, there weren't many times it was actually a hard conversation to have. People were really open to it. I'm so glad. It's almost, you know what's really interesting? A lot of people said to me, oh, that must have been hard. A lot of people must not, a lot of guys must not be open to that. And that's what struck me is everyone thought that, but that wasn't the case. So it made me think even that perception that it must be hard because guys are quite masculine is part of the problem. That actually when you have the conversations, people really open to them. They want to have them. Do they want to feel safe to have these conversations and I could help them do that. So yeah, it's like everyone's like, ah, oh, I'm open and vulnerable and but of course those other people wouldn't be. Yeah. That's fascinating. It's made me kind of think about I wonder if and if you've found this, I'm gonna use um femininity as an example because I um and a am a woman, I feel like I'm someone who is masculine and feminine and if yeah. anything I feel like I can speak more to femininity because I actively tried to kind of think about and work on my feminine energy as a way to combat burnout but what I wanted to say was is whether you have found that people have a notion of I guess like external masculinity and then compared to internal so for me mm. like external femininity might be the way in which I dress the way in which I kind of talk the way in which I might um, do certain activities or relate to people and then an internal connection with femininity for me is it's like you said about the river it's a system it's an approach it is a cycle and it's based around a cycle in particular have you found that with masculinity that there might be like a a difference for people between what it looks like and then what it is to embody it? Hmm. I mean, I actually just feel like the way you just um, described that was a pretty pretty clear. So I just I'd say I agree with what you're saying. I'm not sure how to further expand on it is there is this are you seeing if there's a difference for nah, that's women? cool I'm I'm glad yeah. because we'll we'll know like that and that's really cool to know actually you know mm. the difference between yeah knowing and uh, as to what something look like looks like as we as we see it and then genuinely like oh this is what it means mm. kind of a thing well I'm glad that my uh hypothesis has been um slightly confirmed by you <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, I think your personal experience is really relatable. And, you know, and I think, yeah, I've seen guys that 
you could I found people enjoyed on my series the guys who looked the most masculine. Like they were big hunting, fighting type guys and maybe did those things as hobbies, but were like really soft and um open and good communicators and had gone on that journey to get there. And if anything, I kinda wish I had recorded more of those guys just purely because they're like super popular. Whereas guys that maybe looked less people maybe didn't always watch them as much but actually they had usually had just as much story and, and almost maybe because they didn't look masculine maybe thought they had more to prove at the beginning or more pressure from parents or, or whatever it was or like more complexes around around being a man are you ready for our next question Go on, question number three. <laughs> question number three. Is there a book, a, a sequel to your friend's book called The Third Question? I don't know. <laughs> I, want, I, bet you he's, I bet you he's joked about it or people have joked about it to him. Is yeah, it, probably. <laughs> I wonder if his book's... Oh, there it is. There you go. The Power of the Second Question. Nice. Cool. I don't know Chris why Skillet. there's a, a penguin on it. Not sure. Yeah. I don't know why. They, so there's a penguin on the front of this book by Chris Skillett, uh, The Power of the Second Question, and there's a, a photo of a penguin. Is, what sort of a penguin is that? I don't know. It, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. It kind of looks like a yellow penguin, but it's it's got white where the yellow normally is. There might actually be a metaphor in here. I've never read the whole book, if I'm honest. <laughs> I okay, just that's it. all good. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe it's really on the front there to bamboozle us so that we just continue asking questions. Um, <laughs> okay, so if I was to say to you, does it hurt when you do that? Do that. What is something that kind of hurts or is a bit oh, uncomfortable that you do that is good? Hmm. That's a hard one to answer. It's funny. The, the joke that came to mind was like, um, kind of more like, um, kind of sexual stuff. But that's not my answer. It's, I mean, it's probably just like having, like having, saying hard stuff, like being courageous. Like it's not like being the person who says something to a friend that they don't want to hear or in a social group kind of kills the mood or uh, yeah challenge yeah just like give someone feedback and then they usually you know get upset or turn it back on on me or turn the social group against uh, me because I, I got bullied a lot when I'm younger so I find that's a tactic a lot of people use is they'll quite quickly then go like, oh you just killed the mood didn't you or something and then instantly the whole room is like oh yeah you did and it's like, and I'm not, and I, then I feel like triggered by that. So I'm not very good at like defending myself. So I do, but I just keep doing it. Like I'm a sucker for punishment and I just keep um, bringing things up. And I think, I mean, the thing I'm learning about that is also timing's important. And I think sometimes I haven't always got the timing right. But then I also say, well, when is the timing right? Do I need like make an appointment That's right. with this person? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. In some ways that might even make it more of a thing to maybe change the mood that's that's, that's it or it's like you do do it one-on-one -on -one and privately which i do actually try to do because i think it's better when you don't shame someone in front of others but that's not always possible or even when it is private it's not the best time or you make it or you do you make an appointment and they're like well that's scary and then it's real awkward and not natural and then i feel like a lot more fear actually because they're like no it's coming and have to think about it leading up to it and yeah, and like sometimes it goes really well. Like a lot of people are actually really open and it might just depend on their mood. But yeah, that's, that's something I've continued to do, continue to try and call things. Um, but I'm trying to improve the way I do it. Yeah, I just don't know how. It's, it's just hard. It's actually really hard and it does hurt. Yeah, and you're right though as well that it's so courageous. I'm so interested that you said that because a question that I wrote down to ask you was, you know, how, if you know any, um, I guess like phrases to kind of, like you said, go into difficult conversations. And I love that you're also still figuring it out. But if you do have any language that you have found is the most useful in terms of making them easier, when especially when you're calling someone in or or challenging challenging them on something, what mm. have you found? I guess is is a good phrases to use. I think. Um... One that always stays in my head is feel the fear and do it anyway. 
Um, that's, that's probably one people have heard before. So I do say that to myself. I think the thing I try and think of is what would, how would I want people to do it to me? And that, I mean, of course happens. And, you know, I've done some things that, you know, I really regret um, that hurt others and have been called out for them by friends. And I really respect that. And I'm really happy they did because even if I'm defensive at first, I'm so happy I, I know and learned from it. Hi, everybody. It's me, JJ, in the editing room. Um, hope you're enjoying the episode. It is pretty sensational. And uh, at this part of the recording, I stopped the recording because for some reason uh, the mic was making a sound. And you know when that happens when you're making a call with someone on the internet and both of you are like, I don't know what's happening. Maybe it's your internet. Maybe it's this. Maybe it's that. Um well, the reason Sam gives made me laugh so much and I just had to leave it in. So imagine that uh, I've just said something like, hey, there's something going on with the recording. What do you think it is? Is it you? Is it me? And this is what he says. So oh, I, I wonder if it's okay. the rat on my ceiling. No, I don't <laughs> think it's the rat on your ceiling. <laughs> this happened to me and I thought it was my mic, but it's gone away now. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, so I may have just been, I was, I may have just been rubbing on something, but my mic's hanging from the ceiling, so I don't think it can be. And I think, I think one thing is, I really don't like when people they're like speaking as if, as, almost as if they're looking down on me. They're speaking as if, like, oh, you did this thing, and of course, I wouldn't do that, or I need to educate you on that. Whereas I much prefer when someone's like, it's not even the way they say it, it's just the way, no, it's not what they say, it's the way they say it. If it feels like they're coming towards me with like compassion and understanding and a sense that they've been there too or could have been there, that we're all human and that they're like, hey, you know, I, I love you and I'm noticing you did this thing and, you know, you're not a bad person and um, I'm not perfect either. I mean, I don't need to say all those things, but just that vibe. And then when it when I feel that, I'm much yeah I'm much more likely to receive it. And like private's good, you know. Like I said, it doesn't have to be. I'd still rather it be somewhat public. If it was that was the only time it was going to happen, yeah. If there was an opportunity, um, or the, if it pertained to something I was doing at the time, yeah, that needed to be addressed at the time, and that I you know probably would appreciate it being addressed. So I so I knew. Yeah, that that really helps. I don't know why. I just don't want. Pe- I don't want to feel like below people, like lesser than people. So if I feel that I'm all good, but yeah, the second I feel I'm lectured to, like told off, or yeah, then I'm I get like rebellious or something. Yeah, I think so. I agree with you, and also especially in a group context, you know, for me sometimes. I mean, I this is and this is also part of the reason why I started this podcast is because I was afraid for a really long time to do things like this. And mm. then like courage is something I've been, it is, it's one of my values and it's one that I've really decided to step into in the ways that I can. And so there's times in which maybe I've thought, yeah, this is probably going to, this could kill the mood, but maybe not as much as what letting it go would mm. or letting it kind of be unsaid um, potentially. And I think that approach you said where it's not, not looking down, it's, it's let's let's do it together and Mm. I've I've done this before too and what do you think about it because as we said we're also we said the more you know the more you don't know but also you don't know what you don't know and yeah there's a lot there's a lot out there and there's a lot that's changing as well yeah yeah totally agree totally agree and like yeah maybe on a deeper level like I do I do just generally think genuinely think everyone is equal and I admit that it's funny then at times I don't think that. Like I, I think I've had thoughts of that person being lesser or that person being yeah, not as smart or not as that or this, but it never feels right. It's just like a passing thought that then I later reflect on and question. So I yeah, I don't I, I do believe I believe we're all equal. Yeah, and like could people feed into it too. People are like, Oh, you're such an amazing person or Oh, you sh- you should definitely speak. Like people sort of say, "Oh, you're better than me." You're like, you know, like, and I, I get you get that sometimes as someone that's didn't always used to be confident, but has become a more confident person who does stuff and isn't afraid to be public about stuff. But yeah, I, I yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't believe that 
for a second that I'm worth more than anyone else, despite my stupid brain sometimes making up stupid ego things. What sort of things does it say? If you care to share, or just, or just, it might be like say a situation where someone's voicing an opinion about something psychological in nature and I hear them and I think, cha, <laughs> you know, what do you I've know? I've done a lot of um, study to empirically test that. Uh-huh, yeah. yeah. I, mean, I even got as far as, I even like said that to people to like shut them down and I always feel so, well, I've done it, I can think of one memorable time where I said that and I felt so bad about it afterwards and it really wasn't the right thing to say because I think they respected my opinion and I just like wanted to cut them off. Um, I didn't need to go there. Um, it's just like a tactic. Um, yeah, there's times like that. And I try and remind myself that um, that actually what pretty much every person is saying is coming from their experience. And if they're saying it, it's probably meaningful to them and actually based on a lot more than what you can see um, on the cover of it. So, you know, it's worth exploring that um, even if someone seems potentially toxic. Like, yeah, it's something I've, I've really tried to take account of is that she'd be like, okay, well, I don't agree with what you're saying, but um, why are you saying it? And then usually that yields, there's something valid in it. And I think the second I invalidate it, the second I say that's wrong, someone then then might feel like they're wrong and that their opinion's worthless and they've actually got reasons for it. And I've just like, just thrown them away because I haven't cared to understand them. Maybe that's why the second question is important. <laughs> <laughs> I bet it's in the because it is, You were like, I don't, I don't know if I agree with what you're saying. Why are you saying it? That was the second question. I was like, well, we figured that one out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. I was, that's something that's some advice I'll give to anyone. If you don't agree with someone, just actually just spend a bit more time listening to them and following up on, on why they're saying something. And you might find you agree with that if not the thing they're saying. Absolutely. Or or maybe you can align with the fact that they have a belief in a thing as strong as what you have a, a belief in a thing. And that is mm. where the similarity lies in some ways. That's that's the base for like disagreeing to disagree, I think, is like when it comes back to values and you're like, oh, well, we actually fundamentally like disagree that all humans are equal which I've, I've i've had that disagreement with people and then that's all good you're like okay cool well like i'm not necessarily right you know there's like a lot of people seem to be more on the right political spectrum and like i'm not going to say all those people are wrong because that's like half of people so yeah there must be reasons why they have those beliefs and i'm you know keen to understand them through my research about you I really like what you said about how well what it says is that you want I guess or you see your path or your or your um your focus for your work is to assist people to look internally to better serve our process in co-creating an awe-inspiring future can you can you flesh out really how that what that means and 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 what that looks like on a day-to-day level wow where did you take that from i'm just trying to remember where That's I wrote from that. your bio on your website <laughs> on, on tough talk yeah on tough talk website of course yeah. I was like yeah I was like, some of that language feels dated for me now you know when you oh, do sorry like... yeah 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 <laughs> no so no no, no i mean like, i think i think I think the sentiment is still the same. It was just like hearing it, I was like, wow, that sounds like something I wrote a few years ago. And it, and it is. But yeah, Tough Talk isn't, though I, I'm still yet to produce that Wanganui documentary. It's coming, um, but it hasn't been as present um, in the work I'm doing now. Can you read it one more time? Well, I actually just jotted it down midway through the sentence. So I'll read out what I've got. <laughs> it says, look internally to better serve our process and co-creating an awe-inspiring future. Hmm. Yeah, I think I think what I'm trying to say, I think I you know, I gave the example before with masculinity about how that may relate to to nature. So I think on what I'm trying to say is, you know, I'm a I'm an ever systems thinker and I and one of the things I realized is that I mean, a lot of people look at external systems, so systems of like behavior and um, physical things, like um, you know, like interacting in, in, in complex ways. Um, and I was like, well, that's that goes straight into the invisible stuff. That goes straight into our minds and our like inner beliefs and social behavior, and that's a system too. And it's just like completely and utterly interwoven with with the external in such a complicated way and they, they almost like 
the the physical if you could almost like dissolve it away and the, you could just like see the system playing out and some of the patterns would be the same internally as externally so i think i think what i'm trying to say is if if i can help you sort out what's going on internally which is this massive world like just as massive as the world around you that we spend a lot of time in maybe that'll then help you kind of like do things that serve you and serve others and serve the world um and like yeah i sort of have this belief that if everyone really genuinely followed their true purpose in life like one knew what that was because a lot of people don't and just haven't been educated or taught taught to find it supported to find it yeah so i'm like if everyone just did that i just think the world would sort itself out that's a belief it's like i don't know if that's true um, but it's like a belief I have. And I think that's what I'm trying to say there is I'll help, I'll help you sort that out. Let me become another like, you know, almost like voice in your mind. Like, let me become like this grounded part of your inner world that's going to go on a journey with you and like sort it out, tie some loose ends up and join that together and just like reorganize that and sweep that away. And and then when that all makes sense to you, suddenly you'll be able to engage with the external systems a little bit more clearly and intentionally. Yeah, and also apply this voice of tenderness and compassion like we said when we were talking at the beginning of the I failed Mm. but I'm not a failure Mm. and like you said that a lot of people aren't able to kind of recognize that or be okay with that so to be able to have a voice such as yours to say yeah but you're not Mm. that's it that's that's big eh? it's like First, just getting people to say stuff that they've hidden from everyone because of shame. I think that's what shame is. It's like you hide something because you believe you'll be rejected if you reveal it. So when you suddenly have a relationship with someone which is kind of secretive in nature and there's like almost there's like strong contractual agreement and law around it. So you like you've got that, plus you slowly get to know this person and um, see if you like them and want to tell them this thing which you're scared of saying out loud. You finally say it out loud and they go, That's not so bad. I don't you know, I don't judge you for that, that I can understand that. That they can do a lot for a person sometimes they still don't believe it themselves and i can see why it's like what they did you know i'm not trying to say their behavior was good you know because often it is something maybe like you know i don't use the dichotomy of good and bad but you know they see it as bad and i'm like yeah that was bad but you're not here's you like you know hiding that thing that happened 10 years ago that sort of hurt someone but you've changed heaps then and you hate yourself for it and it's had this massive effect on you and so you clearly don't see it as a good thing you know you clearly don't see it as a line to who you are but it happened um and it, you know that person is hurt so we need to acknowledge that while also not like believing you're at the core a bad person because of it yeah and sometimes that that's that's the, the logic of that doesn't work it's an emotional journey and therapy but yeah the it might involve unpacking heaps of stuff that's threaded into it like like a like a wound you know like an infected wound it's like sure it started there but it's spread throughout the body um that's kind of what it's like sometimes and that's that can be like yeah a real hard process a real long process you might not even get all the gunk out you know that's right yeah my mum gave this great analogy about you know when she was young she would get a thistle on her foot running around the farms in the Marlborough Marlborough area and yeah it would hurt really hurt to to get that out there to get the thistle out you know and and if you don't though it, it, the skin grows over and it can be hard and deep deep in there and to get it out again can be really hard but to live with a thistle constantly in your foot is also not as easy to dance and run around you know mm. <laughs> that's a nice metaphor i like it it's like yeah she's made it really like simple yeah and it's so hard just to like you know grab those tweezers and rip that thing out um and i think as well like the idea of getting a thistle in your foot when you're young like it's a very for me you know it has the it has all notions of like barbecue smells and running around the neighborhood Mm. i was very fortunate to be able to do that when i was a kid so everyone's probably got a different imagery of the thistle in the foot but yeah I think what you said there's really fundamental to good therapy is it's not about just purely wallowing in the negative. Um, you want to like weave that in with like laughs like we're doing, you know, and like good memory, you know, memories like that, that are like, you can always smell them, you know, and like feel them. Um, and trying to remember that stuff as you go through the bad. And I think that helps as part of the healing process. Mm, well, it's like holding a light, right? That kind of, mm. yeah, can shine it through. 
I'm so glad you see it that way because, um, well, with this, with this, with this podcast, like I, you know, wanting to be able to go into the more chewy, crunchy, grisly aspects of what it is, does it hurt when you do that? You know, we're talking about pain and difficult things, but also, well, me, like I, I'm Joanna Joy, like I will talk of, you know, try yeah. and try and bring it back up. And I, I think I really appreciate the way in which we've been able to kind of do both today. Yeah. So I've got one more question for you. Go on. <laughs> if you were to have a message that was to flash up on people's phone or there'd be a big billboard up, what would it be? want to give you a really articulate response but I'm I'll do my best I think I think it's sort of there's been a thread about what we've been talking about that sort of came with um talking about failing at the beginning and yeah I guess I want to say to people like you're not the culmination of all the bad things that you've done or that have happened to you you're you're you and those things in a way are part of you are part of your experience but they don't define who you are there's um yeah there's a whole world of who you are um and just like you're saying a lot of that is the the nice smells at childhood barbecues um and what you do for others and yeah I think through through your behavior um through what you do in the future with that awareness it can be healing you can you can become the person who you want to be um and part of that person will be stuffing up at times and being called out and again it's how you respond to that it's how you um, take on that feedback and grow that's really important that's wonderful there is a whole world of who you are thank you so much for sharing this with me today I feel like that's a, a pretty groovy place to wrap up unless there's anything illuminating that's come to you no, finally I mean, yeah I, mean, I was thinking of all sorts of things um to talk about in response to what you're saying but I mean, that, that could just go for all night and you know, yeah 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 at the, at the end of one at the end of one podcast you're like what's one thing that was it what's one thing you would um wish wish for everyone and i said um a good meal <laughs> a good... <laughs> that is true though <laughs> And they just looked shocked, and I was like, I don't think that's the answer they wanted. <laughs> and it was just maybe a. Uh, that's what you get. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I was just hungry at the time, but yeah, I mean, where I'm going with that is like, yeah, I want to have some dinner soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's your dinner time. Thank you so much for being on here, Sam. Thank you. I had a great chat with you. Thank you. Thanks, JJ. I really enjoyed chatting to you too. Thank you so much for listening and sharing your time with me this week. For this podcast to continue, I could really use your support. If you enjoyed the episode, please screenshot it and put it on your social media, send the episode to your friend or family. And if you can click subscribe to the episodes, they'll fall into your algorithm like your old friend JJ popping into your ear every week. I appreciate it so much. And as well as listening to this podcast, just keep on listening to your own wisdom by asking the questions big and small like does it hurt when you do that don't do that 